and welcome to the latest Motorsport Magazine podcast. And today I'm delighted to say we have with us William's Chief Technical Officer, Pat Simmons, as we look ahead to the 2016 Formula One season. Pat has been with us now for several podcasts. You almost qualify to be on the payroll, I think, Pat, near as, near as damn it, if you send your invoice to Damien, a recommendation. But it's the first time we've welcomed him to Motorsport's well-appointed new home in London NW3. So a very warm welcome, Pat. Thank, Thank you for you being here. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's great to be back. Um, joining Pat with us on the team today, we have Mark Hughes, our Grand Prix editor, Damien Smith, Motorsport Magazine's editor, and Rob Widows. Regular listeners and watchers might be aware that Rob and I seem to have swapped seats. Um, Rob has been a valued member of the motorsport team for many years, a uh, great contributor. If anyone hasn't yet read his Gerhard Berger feature from the March issue, go and read it now. It's a brilliant read. Um, but after hosting the podcast for a long while, Rob is now going to be focusing on other projects, including his fantastic archive of tra track talk radio interviews from the 1970s, which... Um, we will talk about later, but I'm delighted to say that he's with us as a panellist today. So, Rob, welcome. And remember, I'm asking the questions, you're answering, okay? Absolutely can you, can fine. You, can you sort that? Pat's yeah. on the payroll, I'm off it. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got me, Simon Aaron, asking the questions. Off, qu off camera, we have Alan Hyde, one of the UK's finest motor racing commentators and also a brilliant sound engineer who cuts and pastes all this together so that our mistakes aren't obvious, hopefully. And with Ed Foster taking his fourth or fifth skiing holiday of the year, we have Jamie Howlett, who's helping us with production, corralling all the readers' questions, to which we'll come a little bit later. So, um, one name you'll notice is not on the list. He doesn't leave much of a physical void, because he's only about five foot four on tiptoe. But in terms of his contribution, his knowledge, his experience, we'll miss him enormously today, and that's Nigel Roebuck. As regular uh, magazine readers will be aware, I'm sure, Nigel was taken seriously ill very suddenly, quite recently. Um, but emergency surgery was successful. He's recovering very well. And he contacted me last night to issue an apology for not being here. But bearing in mind he's just had a major rebuild at Cosworth, I, th I think he can be excused. And he also asked me to extend his very, very warm gratitude to everybody. He's been completely overwhelmed with all the cards, messages, He's not much of a social media butterfly, but he does know that an awful lot of people have sent messages via the motorsport website, via Facebook and so on, to wish him well. And he is very grateful. We look forward to having him back very soon, and he looks forward to being back very soon. On a similar note, uh, we have to pay tribute, I think, at this point to Nigel's very close friend, Alan Henry. Close friend to all of us around this table as well. Um, Alan passed away on March the 3rd after a long illness. And just before we start talking about F1 2016, I'd just like to do a quick lap of the table with a little reminiscence perhaps from everybody, starting with you, Rob. You know, the Alan Henry you knew. I, I adored the guy. <laughs> he was funny, bright. Above all else, though, I thought he was a fantastic journalist, a proper old-fashioned journalist, possibly not a great writer like Nigel, but I thought that AH's journalism was the thing to aim for. He was, he was a bit of a mentor for me, I must say, in, in my very early days. And we, we had similar um, backgrounds on newspapers. And I still, I still think, um, old-fashioned as I may be, but I still think the local paper is a great place to start journalism. You learn so much about digging for stuff, making sure it's accurate, all, all that kind of thing. And I think Alan took that into motor racing and, you know, he was great at getting the story. Apart from that, he was just a hell of a lot of fun to be with. <laughs> so it's, it's sad, yeah, very sad. Damien? I think the thing that I always remember about Alan is that I first met him when I was in my, my mid-twenties and I was a, a young journalist trying to make my way through and um, I didn't know anyone, they didn't know me, but when he um, was introduced to me, he treated me like an equal straight away, which he didn't have to because I, I wasn't an equal at all. And uh, I was quite daunted meeting someone like Alan Henry because I'd read his stuff for years in MN and uh, um, obviously in all the books that he wrote, we had so many of the books at home. Um, and he was just a lovely bloke and uh, very genuine and extremely good fun company um 
the twinkle in the eye, um, the stories, the endless stream of stories. Um, and, uh, you know, he'd, he'd seen so much. And I always love him talking about particularly Ronnie Peterson and Nicky Lauder. I think um, the stories from that era were particularly funny. And introducing Nicky Lauder to uh, the humour of Monty Python, which um, I think he and, and, and Ronnie as well, I think they were, they were slightly confused by him. But um, he persevered anyway. Well, yeah, Alan was um, a, a great company and great friend. And uh, he was... Um, a lovely link to um, a time when uh, the journalists and the drivers and the team owners were all sort of mucked in together, um, where there wasn't a big disparity in incomes, and so they were staying at the same sort of places. And um, it was a very intimate time, and he, he, he used to have be rich in anecdote about that, and it was it was great to hear about that. And uh, as as everyone said, he was just such. Lovely company and funny and just a uh, joy to be around, really. And Pat? Well, I, I started in Formula One in 1981, and uh, both Alan and Nigel were the sort of, they were the well established Formula One journalists then. And uh, I guess I was a bit overawed by them. But I think both of them uh, have retained a lot of that old fashioned journalism. And, and Alan, particularly, he had that sort of, what I think I'd describe as cynical realism. He, he didn't believe every press release that came out. He dug down to, to see what was behind it. And that's something we miss a lot these days in journalism. Yeah, I think I concur with most of that. I mean, I'd, I first met him when I was 21 and um, my first day at Motoring News in the middle of 1982. And I remember meeting Alan on my first day and thinking, blimey, he's old. And I looked back and he was 34. Um, so it probably wasn't. But, but he, I, mean, as you, I mean, as you said, Damon, I mean, he just from day one, he treated me as his equal, which clearly I wasn't. Um, but I later discovered he was just comfortable with everybody. And I remember chatting in the uh, Bahrain paddock with him. And uh, one of the local guys came up and then went away. And Alan said, did you know who that was? I had no idea. And he was Crown Prince something or other. And But Alan just had the lovely way of, it didn't matter where you were. And he just, he could deal at all levels with everybody. And everyone, warm, everyone warmed to him. And, I, you know, we, we will miss him, dreadfully. But now onto the uh, onto the future, 2016 Formula One season. Pat Simmons, eight days of testing in Barcelona last week, week before. What do you reckon? What have you learned? Well, you've firstly, got an interesting graph. Come on, what's that? <laughs> firstly, eight, eight, eight days of testing was tough. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago when we used to spend the winter probably wasting a fair bit of our time but charging around the, the circuits trying to to learn things uh, and even you know as recently as last year 12 days of testing you know, to come down to, to two-thirds of that you really start to focus your attention and so it's eight pretty tough days uh, I think the interesting thing about winter testing is that um, we all sort of have one eye looking over our shoulder seeing what everyone else is doing and if you think about that logically, it's a very pointless thing to do because, you know, if, if you're out there and you're running and you're the fastest team, you don't sort of say, well, hang on, let's uh, back off for a little while. And equally, if you're, if you're the slowest team, you don't work any harder because you can't work any harder in Formula One. You work as hard as you damn well can. But we're competitive people. And we, we love the spirit of competition and therefore we always want to know where we are. So we spend an awful lot of time trying to analyse uh, what's going on. And believe me, it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and uh, I know you, you guys as, as professional journalists have an even tougher time because you don't have access to the, the data and the uh, the intelligence that, that we have. Um, and it, Are if you we about find to tell us what, every, what, the, what fuel loads everyone was running? Uh, no, I wouldn't dream of doing that. But, but we, we, we obviously spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. So I think, you know, there, there are lots of things going on. Uh, a lot of miles covered I in those eight days. Um, Mercedes, absolutely astounding. They were doing uh, almost three race distances a day sometimes. They were. They did, they did over 6,000 kilometres of testing in eight days. That's, that's why, w why would they do that, Pat? What, what, what's well, I think that there, there are several reasons. Um, I think Mercedes uh, aim to try and get through 21 races on four engines. Uh, which, of course, we're going to have to do soon anyway. Uh, this year, we have the option of a fifth engine uh, because there are over 20 races. So one of the things you've got to do is you've got to get a fleet leader. You, you've got to get one engine that's that's running on as long as possible under under hard conditions. Now, 
all the engines that have been running around in the cars in the last sort of couple of weeks will now be out of the cars and they'll be on dynos trying to complete further race simulations. But I think Mercedes were really, really pushing that forward. Um, plus, of course, you know, when you've got that sort of level of um, competitive advantage, then the one thing you want to make sure is you've got the reliability. And interestingly, the team that covered the second most number of kilometres was, was Toro Rosso. And of course, Toro Rosso, if they had one Achilles heel last year, it was reliability. And had they finished all the races, they, they would have been in a much better position. And obviously, you can see that they've, they've focused on that uh, with over 4, 000, nearly 4,900 kilometres. I mean, having a bulletproof 2015 Ferrari engine, obviously, is has been a significant contributor in that. Yes, absolutely. But but uh, bear in mind last year that, yes, they had the, the Renault engine and that was responsible for a number of their retirements. There were also probably more chassis-related retirements than they'd care for. Uh, and I'm sure James Key uh, has looked at that and said, right, what we've got to do, we've got to get out there and, and do miles. And then you've got a huge bunch of cars that have done the sort of 3,500, 4,000 kilometres, Williams being amongst those uh, at just under 4,000 as the, the team with the third most number of kilometres on there. So there's your, there's your first sort of thing you're looking for in winter testing. There's absolutely no point in being extremely fast, leading a, a race by a lap and then retiring two-thirds of the way through. So we've got to get the reliability done. And... and my engineers know perfectly well my my four, sort of four things that they have to concentrate on that I remind them of time and time again that you have to do things in the right order and the first thing is safety second thing is legality third thing is reliability and only then do you start looking at performance so uh, you know that's why we, we get so many kilometres done um, and then you, you come to performance, and of course lots of different things going on there. Uh, firstly, we've got five tyres now, uh, five, five different compounds. Uh, the ultra soft tyre, which we had a little look at in the post-season Abu Dhabi test, um, but the first time we've really exercised it, so everyone wanting to see how that got on. And I have to say, I was quite surprised by its performance. Um, Barcelona is a, a tough track. It really, you know, it, it, it eats into the tyres and turn three goes on and on and on and the left front tyre just sort of gasps and cries and says enough. Um, but the, the ultra soft, all things considered, I thought was quite a good tyre. So there are all the things of learning about that, looking at your, let's call it a qualifying performance, you know, your sort of low fuel performance and balance, looking at race distances, tyre degradations, and then, of course, trying to find the sort of sweet spot of setup and uh, uh, and evaluate the new parts that you put on the car over over the winter so hell of a lot to do in eight days mark you're a, 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 a prof professor of uh, long run analysis quite often what um what have you made from looking at the uh, the t in terms of the packing order performance wise what have you made from the tests well we can only go of apparent packing order from the outside um and uh, it it looks um, it looks like uh, Mercedes Ferrari and then a whole group of very closely matched cars, Williams among them. Um, do you concur with that, Pat? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yes, I think Mercedes have got a. Uh, they do have an advantage. We. I think uh, we, we put error bars on our data, you know, with our, our sort of confidence levels, and our, our error bars on Mercedes are a little bit wider than everyone else because you know, they have done some unusual things this winter. But even if you took the most pessimistic view at the bottom of those error bars, you still know that they're the fastest. Uh, I agree, Ferrari are close behind. And then there's, there's a, a bit of a gaggle. Um, I believe that we at Williams are third you lead but the it's, gaggle, a, yeah. it's a close run thing with Toro Rosso and Red Bull showing well Force India and Force India yeah. there as well but uh, we can talk about that on the different tyres and the different things yeah so um, we now know we think we know that we're doing the new qualifying system in Melbourne so Q3 is eight cars and if we have that gaggle of four four teams as eight eight cars fighting for let's say four places is it going to be better if you're in that gaggle 
is it going to be better to qualify ninth and have a free tyre choice? Yeah, I think that's that's a good observation. Uh, in the past, there were certain times when it was better to qualify 11th than, well, certainly 10th, but let's say better than 8th or 9th. Now, that moves on a little bit because eight cars in the in Q3, and perhaps we should explain why that's better. The, the, the rules allow you, if you're not in Q3, to have a free tyre choice to start the race, whereas the cars that are in Q3 have to start on the tyre that actually they set the fastest lap in Q2. I know it's complicated, <laughs> but tyre <laughs> rules are complicated. Uh, Keep up, Rob. So, <laughs> the fundamental is... You chose to explain this. <laughs> this, is the this is such simple, wonderful <laughs> entertainment, isn't it? It is. It is. And for my next trick... <laughs> Pat Simmons, your specialist subject. <laughs> but but the f to put it simply, if you get into Q3, you don't have a free tyre choice. You have to start on your qualifying tyres. If you don't get into Q3, you can start on any of the tyres you've elected to bring to that particular Grand Prix. So, so it might be a more raceable compound and also it's, it's fresh, it's new, it so hasn't done the laps. Absolutely. And of course now you're not sort of having to get through so many cars and and that's not a linear thing, you know, it's not like if you're mm. 11th, it, it, yeah. you're, you're three worse off than 8th. You're, yeah. you're actually amongst, if you're 8th, you're amongst people who are a good drivers, you know, so you're not going to get the sort of silly accidents happening. So, how do you go about qualifying ninth? You can't. <laughs> 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 we, we we try all sorts of things, but I don't think any of us are good enough to try and position our car ninth. Is, is seventh better than ninth? Uh, to be honest, until we've done a few races, until we've really seen uh, how the different tyres stack up, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I suspect that's probably uh, mm. ninth, ninth is better than eighth. Yeah, seventh is probably equal to ninth. Yeah. Sixth better yeah, than yeah. ninth. You know, it's, it, it lies in that sort of <laughs> yeah. that sort of <laughs> workspace, if you like. What was the um, what was the reaction from you and your your colleagues when you um, saw the new regs and, and uh, how they were being worked out? Did you groan or did you just see it as a, a new challenge that was uh, exciting for you? You've never heard me groan in my life. Have you? <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think that uh, I think what surprised me was that quite a few people have misunderstood the reason behind them, uh, and I, I was quite surprised talking to a number of people who said, "Well, why are we messing around with qualifying? There's nothing wrong with qualifying," and that's quite true. But the reason to change the qualifying procedure was not to improve qualifying; it was to improve the race. And I think everyone accepts that the problem that we have, uh, one of the problems we have at the moment is that any system that puts the fastest car at the front is not going to give you the best racing and we've had our best races when cars have been displaced from their, their natural position. This new qualifying procedure is quite a, it's a difficult one to handle, believe me. Um, yeah, the old the old procedure had us. Yeah, that was a, an hour of really intense work for everyone on the pit wall. It was it was tough. This one is much tougher, and we will all, from time to time, make mistakes. We will all, from time to time, get caught out by unexpected things. You know, a bit of traffic, uh, a yellow flag, a red flag, which is going to be a very interesting situation now. Um, and the the net result will be that on Sunday, we should see. A few races, I don't know how many, but we'll see a few races where there are people out of their natural position, and I think that will lead to better racing. Just a matter of, I mean, the, the qualifying thing has provoked quite an interesting reaction around the social media and stuff. I mean, if you had a, I'd ask this everyone around the table, I mean, I used to quite like the, the tension that used to build when we had four sets of new tyres for the one hour on the Saturday, and you know, you'd get built and everyone would trip over each other with all 26 cars on the track. I used to quite enjoy that. But, I mean, if you had a... It's your call. How would you like to see qualifying run? And how would anyone around here like to see the qualifying system run? Do you, do you, do you have a perfect favoured solution? I'm a, I, I just struggle a little bit in Formula 1 to have um, anything that's seen as artificial. So I, I'm a little bit old school in, the, in, 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 in qualifying terms. I know it's, it doesn't lead to better races, but... I don't know, Formula One's supposed to be a, a genuine meritocracy, isn't it? I'd, I'd actually 
it be interesting to, to see qualifying decoupled from grid places so that you had a competition to see who is the fastest, fastest over one lap, which you would have to award points for, otherwise there'd be no point in doing it. Um, but that not determining the grid. And have some other method of determining the grid. But um, I suggested it in a column recently, and the responses were uh, generally unfavorable. People didn't know. Outrage, it. wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but don't you think that a lot of people in Formula One, fans and, and people involved alike, are actually quite traditional? Because I, I totally mm -hmm. agree with you, Mark. I, I really do think that's the, a, a very good thing to do. Uh, I do think that qualifying is is quite interesting to to really put the cars on the limit for one lap, and that's a, a good thing to see. And you know there should be the meritocracy rewarded that comes with that, but it does destroy the racing. Uh, and the the trouble is, you know, I think that everyone is reluctant to accept change. It's it's natural, mm -hmm. and I, and I can think back. You know, I said I never moan, but course I moan uh, and going back over the years when you know Max Mosley imposed some very unilateral changes to the rules which at the time I didn't think were the right thing I was wrong he was right you know the fact is a lot of things have got a lot better Cracky, do you remember when we used to do a warm-up on Sunday morning what a waste of time yeah. that was <laughs> you know uh, but when it when it was taken away we all said oh god the cars are going to break down in the race and the, the everything imp reliably improved yeah, it did. It did. Park Ferme has made reliability yeah. improve. The, the great thing in Formula One is that we we work towards the rules that we've got. And this is the interesting thing with reverse grids. Now, I know you say they're, 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 they're maybe a step beyond and what have you, but they will have what I think many people would regard as unintended consequences. The main one being that we would then have to develop our cars to run in the wake of another car. At the moment, we develop our cars aerodynamically in a wind tunnel with clean air, and we try and make the fastest car, and I've spoken about this before, I know, but, but you know, I if you had that reverse grid, we would change the way we went about developing our cars, and overtaking would then become easier. That's a very it good point. Sorry, uh, it seems to me, Pat, that um, the bottom line of this, correct me if I'm wrong, probably am, is that the sport, the business, has to has to get more entertaining because of the television viewing figures, because of the spectator attendances, and because of bringing new sponsors in. So anything, almost anything, that makes it better entertainment, more exciting, would be worth considering. So I think that the new system, if it makes a better race, I, I take Damien's point about it being constructed. But if it makes a better race, that's got to be great, hasn't it? Yeah, I agree. And, you know, qualifying to me is the sideshow. We don't want to be working on the sideshow and then ruin the main attraction. Yeah. You know, that, that's what it's uh, about for me. <coughs> I'll bring in the first of our readers' questions at this point from uh, Jay Saviano. Thank you very much for to all who've submitted questions, and there are quite a lot, as you might expect with Pat. And Jay says, um, I've suggested many times in the past that the front wing should be non-contiguous, somewhat like the cars of the early 90s and existing within the dimensions of the front track, as opposed to the giant intricate front wings of today, which are also ugly. One could go further and spe specify only one or two elements and only one vertical per side. Would that make any real difference of the ability of cars to follow each other? Yes, I think it would. Um, the, the front wings... Uh, you know, it's almost getting to a point where wing is, um, not sure whether it's the right term to use, because yes, there are some aerofoil surfaces there, there are flaps on it, etc. but there are an enormous number of vortex generators. And we use those vortex generators to control a lot of the detached flow further down the car. Um, and the control of that detached flow gives us an awful lot of our performance. So if there is another car in front and it destroys the effect of those vortex generators, then we lose a lot of performance. If they weren't there, we wouldn't have the ultimate performance in the first place. You know, a, a, a simple front wing is not going to operate in terms of total vehicle aerodynamics 
as well as the complex uh, devices we have now. I mean, that's obvious. We, would, we don't do them for fun, that's for sure. Uh, they're, they're far from that. So I, I think if they were simple, uh, I think that it is likely that um, things would be, uh, would be better in that respect. But you can't just sort of hark back to the old days and say, oh, you know, this is the way it was. We didn't have the tools then that we have now. Uh, and now our understanding of aerodynamics is so much higher than it was you know, 15, 20 years ago uh, that I, I think that we would still be, um, we'd still, we can't uninvent. You know, once you know that there's an effect there, you try hard to reproduce it. So I'm sure that we might have a, a simple wing with an incredibly complex chassis behind it or something like that. But given what you were just saying, Pat, about um, you have to design cars to follow each other rather than in the ideal circumstances of running in free air, w next year um, all this talk at the moment about the new regulations is all about lap time and adding downforce, which surely is completely against what you've just said, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's true. Um, you know, if a, if a given sort of basic configuration of car loses X percent in the wake of another car, then if the total is higher, then X is higher. So, yes, it, 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 it's uh, an inescapable fact, I think. Formula One always seems to do this. It just attacks one problem at a time rather than looking holistically at it. And it seems a lot of these um, new regs for 17 it, it, is a, to a attack a problem which is perceived that the cars weren't fast enough anymore is undoing the work that you and a lot of others did in um, the, the overtaken working group. So it's sort of, it seems to sort of attack one problem at a time. Yeah, I, thi I think that's true. And I guess I go back to the fact that if you drive us to solve the problem, uh, and by that I mean not by writing a set of rules that you think might do something, but actually alter the fundamental sporting regulations so that in order to get the best performance for our team, we have to work in these areas, then I, I think, you know, you'll get a better job. But also, you know, it, it's very difficult. Um, the, the FIA work very well through the Institute on Safety Matters, and they put research into it, you know, there's a lot going on with uh, head protection, cockpit forward protection, etc. Uh, we've had the sort of work on launching cars, we've had the work on wheel tethers, all that sort of stuff is done professionally by the FIA through research. The writing and imposition of regulations is not done through research, it's done through an advisory group, um, used to be known as the technical working group, now just an advisory group, that can discuss these things with the FIA, but there's no real research done. E even the overtaking working group that you referred to was really a very, very minor effort. You know, it, it was it, its total output was probably the equivalent to the stuff we do in a couple of days in in, in a proper aerodynamics department. So until you uh, until you you know you had a situation where as a fully funded sport, there was a, a technical organisation researching and writing the rules, then you might get a, a difference. <coughs> On the subject of aero, another interesting question here from Colin Staples, who points out that um, Red Bull this year has painted its car in matte paint, um, presumably not because they can't afford the metallic option. And, I and he wonders, is there any aerodynamic benefit to be had from matte paint? And they're the second team to do that, aren't they? The first one, of course, you know, is Williams. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just <laughs> well done, Pat. <laughs> a good response. It's not what he asked. <coughs> um, but I mean, what 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 is the thinking behind that? Uh, the the surface finish on a on a certain parts of the vehicle are are very important. Um, the requirements are different in different parts of the vehicle, but yeah, there's there's something there. I, th I think um, I think we can we we, we can we can take from that what. Um, well, we will, yeah. Um, and you also mentioned during a previous response to Mark about the, the, the halos. Um, and William Oldacre has uh, written in to ask where you stand on the halo devices. What do you think of them? Uh, I support anything that improves safety. Uh, it's a very, very difficult subject. And with, as with all these things, you know, if you, if you can choose your accident, you can design a car that will withstand it. Um, 
some people say, well, you know, the halo is only half a, a solution. It wouldn't, for example, have have maybe stopped the spring that hit Felipe I- in Hungary uh, a few years ago. Uh, maybe that's true, but it certainly will help with the the detached wheel, the car coming over the cockpit. So. Uh, I applaud it, and uh, I, I have no views as to the aesthetics of it. I don't think they're particularly relevant. I actually don't think it looks bad at all. It looks a bit futuristic, and uh, anything that uh, saves a driver being injured or, or indeed killed, of course I support it. Just going on to drivers, where do you see the balance of power? Um, Mercedes last year... Lewis was very strong for the first two thirds of the season. Then, with the title almost in the bag, he kind of nodded off a little bit. Um, Nico kind of came in and out during the first two thirds of the season. Then was very strong at the end. We don't know how that's going to pan out when, when we get to Melbourne. Maybe it'll be Lewis fractionally ahead again. But you've got two drivers like that, pretty close in terms of performance, but one slightly ahead of the other over two seasons. There's going to come to a point, surely, when driver number two is going to, you know, become a, perhaps going to become a little bit demoralised. Just about thinking back to Renault 2005-2006, you had Giancarlo Fisichella, very strong driver, brilliant on his day, good solid performer. And then you had Fernando Alonso in the other car, who's brilliant on almost every lap, which I'm sure must have fried Giancarlo's head from time to time. I mean, how, when you've got two top-level drivers like that, but one just fracturing the head. How do you, how do you sort of massage the, the second one to keep things stable? Uh, it's difficult. Um, I'm an engineer. Engineers aren't very good with people. We don't understand the equations that, that than, govern yeah. people. Um, <coughs> no, maths, not Spanish. <laughs> um, but yes, you're right. I mean, I, I can go back further than that. And I think I first saw this really when um, Michael was driving the, the, the Benetton and how his teammates really found it difficult to understand just what he was doing. And and it could be pretty demoralising. And equally, for the team, you sort of think, well, cracky, you know, that, that, that other guy's not very good. Look, he's not, he, he's not doing what the number one's doing. The fact that he might be the second best driver in the world sort of can sometimes escape you. It, and it is a really difficult thing. It's not just the drivers, you know. Th- although we we operate as a team, there are two sides to the garage, and there is always a little bit of um, friendly, I hope, rivalry uh, within the team. So it's a really difficult thing to manage because it's a difficult thing to understand. Looking at, at what happened with, with Lewis and Nico last year, I don't understand that. I, I, it really surprised me the way things things went. You look at testing, you know. I, I got the impression maybe Nico had the upper hand in in testing, but did he? I really don't know. So I think that's going to be one of the fascinating stories of 2016. Mark made Sebastian Vettel the driver of the year for him in his motorsport top 10. And I have to say, I concur with that, just insofar as the guy who got the most out of the materials is disposable most consistently, I think last year was Vettel. How did you you rate his performance? Yeah, excellent. I think I would probably struggle to separate him from Hamilton last year in terms of getting the most out of the the equipment. But uh, yeah, Vettel was there all the time. Um, I, I mean, I've always thought he's a great driver, a g- good guy as well, which I like. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm 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 not going to argue that one. <coughs> Go back to um, a question we hear from Bruno Cabral. Thank you very much, Bruno. After crunching the numbers, doing all the correlation, what do you think Williams' realistic chances of winning a race in 2016 are? Well, number crunching doesn't tell you who wins races um, because um, uh, the, the, the trouble is that y- you can assess your own performance, you can assess the performance of others, and therefore you can start to put likelihoods on things. But if, for example, you look at 2014, where there were three races that were not won by Mercedes, in each case it wasn't they, they were won by Red Bull, and it wasn't because Red Bull outperformed them on the day. It's because Mercedes had problems, so Red Bull were in the position to to take those wins. There, there could have been three other races. It might have been another team, be it Ferrari or Williams or, or whatever. So quite quite hard to say, but I th- I think if we look at our our overall um, position, 
uh, with 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 all the cars at all the time. Um, I think at Williams, you know, we we do feel we're in third place. Uh, we do have a bit of a gap to Ferrari and to Mercedes. Toro Rosso and Red Bull are not far behind us. Um, so, in a way, that that sort of suggests that the situation is very similar to 2014, 2015. What I'd like to think is we've actually, as well of, as improving the pace of our car, because we, we are a little bit closer to, to Mercedes, I believe, than we were last year, uh, as well as improving the pace of the car, I think we've sharpened up our operations a little bit. So I hope that we'll be there to, to grab those opportunities. On, a, on which note, Peter Pogan has emailed in to ask whether you'll have the same specifications of of Mercedes power unit as the factory team from race one to race 21. Yep, that's uh, what I believe. We certainly, we ran everything s thus far in exactly the same formats. We've had a, a sort of schedule, the, the, the engines are physically identical, but we've also had a schedule of the, the sort of duty cycle that we'll be running and we've run exactly the same as them. Um, somebody called Ed, who I presume is not the one on the ski slopes, but a different Ed, um, has written in to say, are there any circuits that have been used on the F1 calendar in the past that aren't there anymore that you'd like to see reinstated? And I'll I'll run that one round the whole table. All su all suggestions welcome. Osterite ring. You mean you mean the Sorry. full you mean the full one, not the sawn off one, don't you? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's sadly, sadly, sadly closed. But um, yeah, I know. But, but you, you, you could you could reinstate it pretty you could restate reinstate it pretty quickly. The Burgring Old Spa, but it's it's not yeah, really yeah, feasible. Yeah. But yeah, <laughs> I, th I think I think he means current oh, co contemporary oh, circuits. I see, I see, yeah, yeah. I see, right. Okay. I think in terms of uh, yeah, realistic option, um, I always loved going to Imola, and I always felt that was a great start oh, yeah. to the yeah, European season. Shout. It was a great, it was just so a great weekend. Everything about it. Yeah, I loved you know the place, the where you used to stay, and the circuit itself, the, the crowd obviously as well. I used to love walking around there on a Friday during practice and just just soaking it all up. It was a fantastic place. Could put a Istanbul track in rural France. Yeah, that would be good. That would be good. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. About where Manicourt is. In fact, it would be. <laughs> yes, it'd be perfect. Yes. I thought the British Grand Prix at Brands Hatch was pretty good. A yeah. Of, yeah. A lot of people <laughs> will hate me for saying that. But yeah, that's you fine. couldn't put the crowd anywhere near it now. Though, no. No. I know, I know. I know. I know. But. But. I guess I, I'm pretty happy with where we race. I, I do agree. The old Oosterreich ring was. It was a real challenge of the the ones we've raced out in the last say 30 years or something in terms of um you know the the sort of Imola thing that you mentioned i, I guess sandvo i used to enjoy going there that was always a little bit different but um i, I quite like where we race these days one of the things i liked about the old Ersterreich ring going back to the mid 80s when your benettons were flying around with bmw power I could sit with my backside on the exit, top of the arm curve, the exit of the Bosch curve, and they'd be coming past it at Nancy 197 or whatever it was. It was just one of the most kind of se biggest sensory overloads. You could, that was fabulous. Just yeah, fabulous. it was the the the, the 186 Benetton with uh, five bar of boost on the BMW engine, round the strike ring. It was about 1400 brakes. Yeah, 1350. Um, it's enough. About about 80% of the downforce we got now. Oh yeah, that, that <laughs> caught your attention. Have you noticed how everybody is suddenly grinning? <laughs> <laughs> can I uh, can I ask a quick question, please? Um, I don't really understand engineers. <laughs> I'm better with people, but um, I'm. I just want to know when you build you build the car at Grove using a huge amount of computer technology, all uh, some amazing kit, and everything looks great. Do you still get it to Barcelona on day one and think, hang on a minute, it doesn't work here on the Spanish tarmac? Does that still happen? Uh, I can't pretend to say that our simulations are 100% accurate. They're, they're, they're far from it. Um, I think in on the aerodynamics, on the vehicle dynamics side, the, the way the chassis works, ignoring the tyres, the way the chassis works, I think we're very very close to understanding what we need to understand from that aerodynamically there are a few areas that can cause us headaches um, there are some areas that are quite critical and we can get them slightly wrong in simulation and have an effect 
But the thing that I think we we all find quite difficult is tyres. Um, yeah, you know, they 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 really are critical to use. They they're not easy to understand. They're not easy to model. Um, we get better year on year, but uh, I I think you know our. our confidence level in our, our total simulation it is certainly sits up in the 90 percent uh, you know mid mid 90 percent and, and most things but it's it's not 100 percent that's for sure on that subject pat what um what did you learn at barcelona about the behavior the the new spec of prelli with the the underlay what what effect is that going to have what well are the implications on that that's really interesting i had a meeting with prelli yesterday actually and uh, i was saying to them we just simply cannot detect it we we if 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 they hadn't told us it was there we wouldn't know because we've run down uh, and this underlay is meant to come in at sort of you know seventy to eighty percent wear we've run below that with no detectable cliff we, we've got <laughs> linear so it degradation still continues to dig absolutely yeah. but not at a different rate no no and that's on a a cold track you know whereas we thought that uh, we might see it quite severely there but mm. um, absolutely not done what we we thought it might do can a driver l do a stint flat out without I inducing no. too much deck no 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 we still we still have this uh, this problem not being able to push the tires as much as we'd probably like so other than the fact you got more choice this year um it's gonna be the same story basically i think so yeah yeah uh, you know unless things change significantly when we get onto a, a hotter track which i don't believe they will um yeah it's it's just down to the the tire choice and the fact that teams may have made different tire choices uh, this idea that um you can differentiate the tire choice even within the team how would you go about that what would be the program if the choice between two of those three are, are, are close how would you go about would would you actually put one driver on a different program and keep them on that, or would would you analyze it after Friday? How would it at work? At the moment, that that's not the way we've we've approached things. Um, I mean, we'll we'll see today when Pirelli uh, announced the choices for Australia, which are, which are due out today. We'll see how other teams have have handled it. Um, we have on some of our choices, we have not allocated exactly the same for both drivers but that's due to sort of reasons of things we want to do during the practice sessions uh, I still think that fundamentally if you've got two drivers who are of similar performance who have the car set up in a similar way who are likely to qualify in a similar position um, then the chances are that there is one unique strategy which should be employed and that would require same tyres for, for both drivers. But uh, let's see as we go on, because I think we've got a little bit to learn there. Just <coughs> changing the subject slightly, one team we haven't mentioned so far, McLaren Honda. Did you see significant signs of progress? They certainly seem to have more reliability during the tests. Did you see much performance progress? Yeah, they had a, uh, certainly had a lot more reliability. Um, they did 3,300 kilometres in, in testing, which is... A About the same as they did last season. <laughs> probably. You know, it, it's within 500 of the sort of, you know, th that big bunch at the, at the, the sort of 3.8 mark. Uh, in terms of performance, um, we have them still about a couple of seconds off the, the Mercedes, so still something to do there. But they did seem to have much better straight line speed so I suspect that their uh, energy release problems from last year they, they've got round a little bit but uh, still still some work to do at the moment we see them actually behind uh, behind Renault and then a, a good step behind the sort of the Force India Red Bull uh, Toro Rosso Williams bunch. You, with all due respect to Williams do you think there's a, an argument to be made the, for the, about the in terms of performance per penny, Force India actually does a better job than anyone at the moment. Um, I'm not sure how much their their budget changes, but uh, they, they certainly at the end very, very of solid for a team that's yeah, at the end had of financial financial at the end of last year, years. They, they I think they were exceptional, and they've started this year well. 
good. Um, this is probably a question for your graphic design team rather than you uh, as an engineer, Pat. But uh, Anthony, Jen Anthony Jenkins has said that the Williams is by far the prettiest car in the pit lane, ruined by the piddly little numbers on the sides. Why don't you put big numbers on like the Saubers do to help the spectators? Uh, yeah, I'll pass that over to graphics. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's been a bit of a bone of contention, hasn't it? Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why they they had this strange rule that you can't change your helmet design, was to, to help spectators. But I don't know how big the numbers really have to be before you can really tell. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I think you the should say there's a technical reason, but you can't tell us what it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's to do with matte paint. I, I guess next year with the head protection, wh whichever model of head protection we end up with, in terms of just working out who's who is going to be become harder, isn't it? Because you, you well, unless you have color coded head protection, like they have the color coded TV camera yeah. shrouds, which, they, which, which they, would, they do need do something it. to help. Yeah. I think certainly. Do you think many people know that the TV shrouds are color coded? I, 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 know, I, know, I know people. I know people who've worked in the press room for a very long time who took a, who didn't who, who hadn't noticed it, but I won't name names. I would have thought they're, that not, they're not sitting around this table. The head protection is a further chance for a sponsor, isn't it? Does it actually the head it protection? The does it does it have any uh, um, big aerodynamic uh, effect being uh, over the cockpit like that? I, I, ha I have to say we haven't uh, we haven't run it on a model yet. It, it's going to be a prescribed uh, device, so we can't spend ages developing the the aerodynamics of it. But uh, we we haven't yet run it on a model in the tunnel. W what do we think of um, Lewis's idea that um, it should be up to the driver to choose whether he has it or not? Is that is that completely out Well, then everybody wouldn't choose it, even though <laughs> they would want to choose it. They couldn't afford to choose it, could they? That's where that leads, isn't it? So it's not workable. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. I mean, you know, what, seatbelts as well, hands device. Yeah. Helmets. Absolutely crazy. Pat, we've got a, a new team for the first time in four or five seasons, um, although Mana Marusha MRT has been recycled several times. But what have you made of what you've seen of um, Haas so far? Yeah, they uh, certainly a great start, wasn't it? Uh, and the beginning of testing, you thought, wow, yeah, they, they're, they're on top of it. But then the reality comes home, off. doesn't <laughs> it? And uh, yeah, I think the, the, the last four days were quite traumatic for them. Um, what did they end up doing? Only 2,200 kilometres, so, you know, less than, than any other team. Uh, so I, I suspect there's a long, hard road in front of them. Uh, in terms of competitiveness, they look to be uh, a good step in front of Manor, but uh, but behind everyone else. Also need to ask you about your old team, Benetton, Renault, Tolman, Lotus, Renault. Um, <laughs> the you wouldn't want that on your business card, <laughs> would Not you? really, no. <laughs> um, team Enstone. Um, the car seemed to run pretty well whenever Kevin Magnussen was in the car, when it was in it. Um, and then every time Jolien got in it, something seemed to go wrong. I just wonder, what, what, what did you assess watching them? Well, I, I don't think a driver can make a car go wrong. No, no, know, no. They're, 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 the cars are so sophisticated these days, you, you can't break them in the way you used to in the, with the old cars. So I think that was probably just uh, tough luck for, for Palmer. Um, they're sitting sort of midfield. They've got a, a fair bit of work to do. Um, but They've got a lot of money. They're starting to suck people out of the other teams. Um, got Bob Bell, who you know we all know is a, a good guy for getting these things together. Um, I think that this season will be tough for them, uh, and you know they need more people. They, they, the the place was bled dry over the last few few years, and. You know, you, you you don't sort of uh, approach an engineer these days and say, come and work for me next week. You're talking six months, a year, two years ahead, depending on contracts and things. So it'll take a little while to get them themselves established. But from what I hear, there's a very good budget there. So ultimately, why not? And they've got Mario Illion lurking with his engine mods to be introduced down the road. To be honest, I know nothing of that. So uh, only what I read. Um, interesting question comes in from uh, Bill Kinkella. So you've got a clean sheet. You're a com you're in complete control of Formula One. What would the tracks look like? <laughs> Gosh, that's a that's a left field one. Mm. Uh, complete control of Formula One. What do the tracks <laughs> look like? Gosh, 
Yeah. You thought I was going to ask you about the cars, didn't you? You're not old enough yet. Do you think anyone would ever be in complete control of Formula One? Well, I I know that uh, a lot of people do criticise Tilke, uh, and I think there was a stage when a lot of his tracks were a, a little bit similar. But you know, when you, you look at some of the the tracks, uh, you mentioned Turkey a minute ago. You know, Turn Eight at Turkey was a fabulous corner, a- absolutely one of the best that we 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 raced on. I think the Circuit of Americas is a great track. Um, Answer to your question, the things I like, I like high-speed corners, I like high-speed change of direction, I like corners where the radius decreases, they tighten up on you, they're, they're difficult. Um, you know, a, a corner that, that, that widens out as you go through it is an awful lot easier. So uh, those are the sort of things I'd look at, but boy, I'm far from being an expert on circuit design. Talking of high-speed corners, uh Lorenzo from Melbourne has uh, written in to say, when he's trackside at the first race in 2017, will he notice the difference in, the term, in terms of the cars being five seconds a lot quicker? Will it be visibly different? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, if he's trackside in 2016 during P2, when we all go out and we run our, our new tyres uh, two of our new tyres on relatively low fuel then we put about we slow the cars down by about four four and a half seconds by putting fuel in does he notice anything then I suspect not I can't so I don't think that lap time is something that is visible indeed it's almost it's often the opposite you know a car going quite slowly in the wet where it's sliding around and uh, the guy's controlling it that's that's the sort of thing you notice a a car that's really nicely balanced and uh, uh, can just sort of slingshot through a corner isn't something that's spectacular and it isn't something that people trackside really see, I don't think. Did they sound particularly different in Barcelona to you? No, they didn't. <laughs> in spite of what I'd said uh, about the measurements that we Mercedes had taken, uh, I, it, it was interesting. In the first test, of course, we had a, a 2015 Sauber there. So you, you got that um, uh, that sort of control to 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 uh, rank things against, and I, I I didn't go out trackside. I was in the pits all the time and most of the time in the garage. But uh, I didn't sort of suddenly think, oh, that's a sour going down there. That's a lot quieter or anything like that. So can't say I really noticed it, but um, we'll see. Just in terms of Melbourne, um, a lot of people have been talking about Toro Rosso as a potential. Uh, um, even a podium if, if, if there's reliability problems with the Ferraris and the Mercs. Um, do you see... And the Williams. And the Williams, yeah. I, mean, I was going to say, do you think <laughs> it's going to be Williams versus Toro Rosso at least for maybe fifth and sixth or better, depending on what happens? Uh, I think Toro Rosso are very strong, yeah. Uh, I think, you know, they, they, they were strong last year. It was a damn good car. They've moved up again. Um, that Ferrari engine is a, a good help to them. Uh, I think they're going to be fighting yeah and their drivers as well i mean i mean those two two young guys they they great performers last year yeah absolutely and you know your second year as a driver uh, has got to be good hasn't it you know you 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 go there with that confidence and knowing the circuits and sort of being an old hand in your your second year and uh, that's got to count for something talking of young drivers three newcomers on the grid this year joe palmer rio harianto pascal verline did you, did you get much chance to assess any of them during tests, and what did you think? Uh, no, I didn't. I I, um, I suppose selfishly I concentrate my 19-hour days on things that are going wrong. And in on the Matt White Williams. <laughs> yeah, that's right, exactly. So the rest of it, I haven't really uh, looked to what they're doing. I, I know that uh, within the Mercedes team, Verline has a... A lot of following. A lot of people think he he's the real deal, but um, no, that, that's not been on my radar. Drivers these days have such long careers. If you you know you look at someone like Felipe, for example, I mean his career is almost double the length of someone like Jackie Stewart um, in terms of how long he's been going on. What's it like working with someone who's been around that long? Is there, are there pros and cons to having having someone of that experience? Maybe you should ask them. I've been around a long while. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think. Um, you know, over the last few years, I've actually been at sort of both ends of the spectrum with uh, my time at Marussia with, you know, some new guys coming in where you sort of 
you do suddenly realise they don't know a lot of the things that are taken for granted for many years. Uh, at Williams, of course, we have both, or have had both. I think Valtteri now is absolutely settled in. But, you know, it, it, I, I was regarded 2014 as Valtteri's rookie year because 2013 was, was such a difficult year for him. Uh, and you do see that improvement, whereas with, with Felipe, you know, you, you've got a more steady thing. But all of us, you know, th this is my 40th year in motorsport. I'm still learning all the time. Um, I think the drivers are, are the same. There's always something new to, to learn. You said, uh, so <coughs> I'll just interrupt if I may. Um, you mentioned that when you were at Manor, the young drivers coming in didn't seem to know very much. Do you think that's partly a function of the fact that everything below Formula One now is, or almost everything below Formula One now is one make? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely. I, I think that's that's very true. Formula One, yeah, apart from the fact that budgets are, are outstanding, but the whole technology I, I, is just, it's on a completely different plane to any other formula, a, any other single-seater formula. Um, and and that does make a difference. So it's not like it w when I started you know, Formula 3, Formula 2, they were quite technical um, series f relative to Formula 1. You know, nothing was particularly technical in those days. But the difference between a Formula 2 car and a Formula 1 in the uh, late 70s, early 80s was, was very little. Uh, these days, you know, a, a GP2 car... There's very little you can do with it. You, you don't develop it. You you have limited data acquisition on it. Formula One, you know, these huge teams, these five, six, seven hundred people all working towards a, a very, very technical exercise. Yeah, it's a, it's a really, really different way for drivers to go about things. Pat, I wanted to know, why is it that um, the weekend in, in Melbourne is hardly ever anything of a guide to the rest of the year there are always lots of accidents and you, you can't come away from it thinking well, you know this is where we're going forward can you why is that no you can't uh, I mean statistically you should never take a sample of one as being uh, anything that can establish a trend anyway but I think particularly you know we, we spend all winter driving around the drivers sort of trying to keep out of each other's way so they can understand their car set their lap times all this sort of stuff we spend ages sort of while we're sitting there with all our, our GPS based maps and we're telling the, the, the pit crew right let the driver out now so he's in clear traffic and everything while we're testing then they go to the, uh, the first event and of course there are lots of other cars around uh, and they tend to drive into each other and things like that so a little bit of spatial awareness is is uh, training is needed I think in that first race so you do get more accidents there it is a I wouldn't say it's a unique circuit but it's a circuit that it, it certainly isn't like Barcelona where we do our testing it's not like the classic uh, types of circuit that we we go to a bit uh, later in the in the season, so it's a, it is a little bit different. And you're right; it does. Um, although well, I, I think the right man generally wins, it doesn't show the the complete uh, uh, pace through the field. This is possibly perhaps the most technical question we've ever had emailed to us. I'm going to struggle with. <coughs> oh, I don't know. It's, uh, I think we'll, we'll struggle. Uh, uh, from Peter Bukov Chan, who says. What is the purpose of diffuser strakes? Are they vortex generators or channel subdivisions? How does a vortex reduce the effective angle of attack on the diffuser ramp? Well, can, you, can you do that in layman's okay. terms in about 10 right, seconds? Can I please? pass that one over? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Any they, they're, they're, they're not really vortex generators. They, they, are to, um, they are to direct flow. There's, there's quite a strong cross flow uh, at the rear of a car, if you can imagine. Right behind the tyre, you've got a very low pressure area. Uh, you're trying to feed air through the diffuser. It wants to get out to that low pressure area. You want it to get there eventually, but you want it to, to do it in a controlled manner, so the strakes uh, assist that. OK, we're, we're coming towards, an, uh, towards the end of the show now, and I'd just like to get around the table. We know what we think, we know what Pat thinks is going to happen in 2016. What would be a, an ideal 2016 for you guys? Starting with you, Rob, what would you like to see this year? OK, well, I'd love to see Williams win a race, not just because Pat is sitting opposite me, but I would love to see that. 
having been sort of friends with them for many decades. And also, I'd like to see a different team and a different driver win the World Championship, not Mercedes or Hamilton. I don't care who wins, um, but I'd like to see four or five teams win races and have a, a championship battle that goes uh, a bit further this time. Um, and um, I think given the qualifying we have, whether we like it or not, there does seem to be a potential there for some uh, some interesting outcomes uh, to, to races. And um, I just hope we get some good racing, basically. Yeah, yeah I, I, I concur with Damien. I don't care who wins, um, as long as it's the... Um, the, 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 the merit based the, the right person wins or the right team the right driver team combination um, it would be fantastic if that were less one sided than it's been the last two seasons um, I think there's some hope there uh, let, let, let's see um, but, but yeah I'm looking forward to some uh, exciting racing I think there will be um, especially in that midfield thing we're talking about a little bit early, not the midfield but the, the, the cut off area of Q2, Q3, uh, d that seems set to be mixed up. Um, and I hope this new qualifying system does um, result in some um, you know, mi mixed up grids that, that will uh, improve the racing. And Pat? Uh, yeah, I don't care who wins, wins whether it's Valtteri or Felipe. Um, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to, to see a Williams win. Uh, I would like to see unexpected outcomes. Uh, I think that's probably the, the most important thing. Um, I hope we continue to enjoy our racing. Well, knowing the kind of level of enthusiasm around the table, I'm sure we'll, we'll all continue to do that. So, signing off, thank you very, very much indeed, Pat, for joining us yet again. Thanks to all the rest of you for your contributions. Wishing everybody a great 2016 season. Wishing Nigel Roebuck a continued speedy recovery. We look forward to seeing you next time. Don't forget that over the past six months, motorsport has been delving into an audio archive. Back in the late 1970s and early 1980s, Rob Widows recorded a radio show called Track Talk on Radio Victory. He interviewed the likes of Bernie Eccleston, Nelson Piquet, Derek Bell, John Surtees, Sterling Moss, and even motorsports Dennis Jenkinson. We've digitised all of the Track Talk tapes, and these are available through shop.motorsportmagazine.com. I can't recommend these highly enough. They're amazing windows into the past for only £1.99 per download.